Now, actually, you've ended up on the point where I always want to ask this question myself. Um, I want to sleep well at night. <laughs> and, uh, and this is with all kinds of technology. And with nuclear power, obviously, the uh, situation in Hong Kong is that the plants are outside our own direct jurisdiction. Uh, that is not to say that they can't be well managed, uh, but I think for uh, people in Hong Kong and obviously people who are living uh, in Guangdong province as well, uh, we all want to sleep well at night. So I think as we expand uh, nuclear power in China, uh, I think it is in our collective interest to explore how we can do that. But in any case, we have, uh, we have about uh, 20 minutes and we welcome any questions from many of you. Also, uh, any of our experts who are with us today, uh, we have experts from France and uh, the UK. If you would like to make contributions, you're also welcome to do so. Yes, there's a hand right at the back. This is Angelique. I come from Taiwan. As everybody knows, Taiwan is very serious about this problem. And we all know this is a any time, any second bomb in the whole world. And any place happen this, it will influence everybody. So what would I like to know at this moment, is there any policy between the different country or the NGO has a comprehensive communication between different area nuclear? Because if this happened secretly, because these few years you could see the earthquake, everything happening so frequently. So as Christine said, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep well since the past few years because I personally I have six children. So anyway, everyone who attend this meeting here all very, very concerned about our planet. So we hope to see more better situation to be handled in the future. So this is from my heart, or even though I'm the very familiar with this topic, but everyone do concern. Thank you. I, I wonder whether that's a question about uh, international, international regulation. Um, uh, just a, a couple of comments on that. Um, one of the key lessons learned in the United States after the Three Mile Island accident was there was a, a self-regulatory organization that was developed that was called the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. And in the United States, and, and the whole genesis of, of INPO was in fact a direct relationship to the point that I raised earlier, and that is, is that the quality and the professionalism of the, of the nuclear operators is at the core of safely operating a nuclear power facility. And in the United States, at least, the, the, the INPO organization has, has dramatically influenced uh, the, the overall safe operation. Uh, after Chernobyl, uh, the World Association of Nuclear Operators was created, and that organization was modeled after the INPO organization. And the whole purpose of the, of the WANO, or the World Association of Nuclear Operators, was to exactly replicate the process uh, on a global scale that was done in the United States after, after the development of INPO. You know, quite honestly, it, it's had sketchy results. Uh, there, there are countries around the world that, that nuclear operations and nuclear excellence has been achieved. There are other countries where it's been not as good as we would like it to have been. One of the calls uh, that I read uh, recently in, at, at, in the aftermath of Fukushima Daiichi is there have been a number of calls for the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a branch of the United Nations, uh, to increase their role and their responsibility in terms of uh, nuclear, global nuclear oversight. So I guess we, uh, there, there's, I think that there's a global recognition of this need, and we'll just have to see how that plays out over the next weeks and months. Hi, Michael. I'm Mark Clifford from the Asia Business Council. Thanks for an excellent presentation. One area you didn't talk about was an area of vulnerability is waste, and uh, we saw at Fukushima on-site waste was an issue. My understanding is um, at Daya Bay and many other facilities around the world that waste is stored for quite a while on-site. So I'm wondering if you could talk about waste disposal, both the short-term on-site as well as longer-term supposedly permanent disposal, especially in the context of China. Uh, a few comments on, on waste. Um, you, you remember in the one slide that I showed where it showed the guys putting the the glowing blue fuel assembly into the into the storage racks in, in the spent fuel pool. Uh, with with the, the current technology and with quote unquote the way things are done today, nuclear fuel as it's removed from the reactor has to sit in a pool of water with active cooling 
for, for about five years before it can be safely transported away from that pool of water. So with quote unquote, again, the way we do things today, fuel has to be stored on or near the reactor itself for roughly five years, maybe seven years, before we can actually do something with it. Um, so, so the typical process is we store it locally for five to seven years, and then um, different facilities have different policies, different countries have different policies. Then it's either moved to either a, a different location, or in some cases, it's a longer term storage facility. Uh, I was speaking with a guest this morning from Finland who has a quite active program for a long term uh, underground storage uh, uh, facility. Clearly, I think that the events at Fukushima Daiichi uh, illustrated to us that that putting our head in the sand and deciding that we're just gonna leave it sitting around is probably not a sustainable strategy. And so I think that that's one of the things that we're gonna see uh, on a going forward basis is uh, policy being developed uh, globally that says basically, we, I got that you can't move it for about five to seven years, but in terms of managing the overall risk of the nuclear fuel cycle, you simply can't just keep it on site on an indefinite basis. You're gonna have to be doing something with it. There's gonna have to be technology developed, there's gonna have to be policies developed, um, but I think that that's probably going to be one of the more active things going on in the industry on a going forward basis. Uh, different countries will have different policies, I'm, I'm certain of it. I, I wonder if our two friends from France would like to comment on this. Um, yes, Mr. Bari. Mr. Bari just got off an airplane uh, to come here. <laughs> and Sorry. Uh, if, for those of you who might have noticed, uh, he came into the room a little late because uh, his, his flight only arrived at 8.30 this morning. So thank you for being here. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, France is among the countries where the nuclear waste is uh, treated slightly differently. Uh, after uh, one and a half year in the pools uh, on the site, they are actually shipped to a central uh, storage facility in uh, La Hague. And then the fuel stayed there um, five years, maybe. Uh, but it can be transported after only one and a half year, no problem. And uh, after those five years, uh, we, uh, we process, that's the terms, the fuel to recover what's left of uranium and plutonium, make it new fuel from it, and we vitrify the, remain, the, the waste, the remaining waste, meaning the fission product and the few minor actinides, because uh, they become a glass block, which is uh, very uh, resilient to corrosion and which can uh, stay in surface for a long time without creating any risk. For instance, uh, uh, glass blocks coming from the reprocessing of Japanese fuel can be shipped back to, to Japan without any problem. And of course, like Finland, our uh, ultimate goal is to go to geological deep storage, disposal if you want, and in France we have a law which says that the first repository must be operational by 2025. Well, I know the issue of nuclear waste is of great interest to many people. Uh, one of the things that we hope to do at Civic Exchange is perhaps devote uh, one session uh, at some sometime in the future on the issue of nuclear waste and how that is, you know, how it's being handled uh, internationally, what are the trends, and perhaps also focus on what's happening in China. So. Uh, we probably won't have time to go into great depth on the issue of nuclear waste, but it is recognized that this is an issue of great public interest. Uh, any other issues? Yes, please. My name is Mike, also. <laughs> I'm, I'm Michael Edisis of the Advanced Institute and uh, School of Energy and Environment at City University. Um, Michael, I, you've made it uh, clear, I think, that you believe that uh, accidents uh, like the ones that have occurred are likely to happen again, uh, probably infrequently. But I wonder if you can address what I think is the, the obvious next question, and that is, how bad is that? Uh, every every uh, uh, form of energy alternative has its risks, uh, and they're very different kinds of risks. In the case of nuclear, this is a clear risk, but how bad are the consequences? Uh, in the case of uh, Fuku Fukushima, uh, it, it was big in the news, but the uh, consequences in terms of the number of fatalities uh, and morbidity are probably much, much less than the 
tsunami that, that, that caused the accident. Uh, so that my question is, how bad would it be to live in a world in which there is a lot of nuclear power and every once in a while there's a major accident that runs out of control? Uh, just what are the risks? Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, you're, you're reaching the bounds of my, of my uh, willingness to, to comment because I'd really rather prefer to stick on the, the technology and the operations, but uh, I'll uh, try to touch on it as best I can without obviously avoiding the question that you're asking. Um, you, you know, it's, it's a relative question because if, if you don't live downwind of the power plant, for you, it's a, you know, I had an accident, okay, you know, fine, whatever, Epco goes bankrupt, why do I care, right? But if you happen to be one of those people that got relocated, probably can't go home for the next nine to 12 months, or if God bless your children end up with, with, a, with an autoimmune issue, or cancer, for you it's a big deal. And making that kind of a decision uh, is really a social matter, and it's a policy matter that the com countries have to decide for themselves. I can't sit up here and tell you that even though the science and the statistics will tell you that nuclear power is one of the safer, safest forms of generation, if you consider the number of people who die, die in coal mine accidents and LPG explosions and blah, 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 you know, you, I can sit up here and I can give you all the scientific evidence, but at the end of the day, it's a social matter. We saw in Germany that the people of Germany have decided that they don't want nuclear power, and that's for them to decide, it's not for me to decide. In other countries of the world, for different reasons, they've decided nuclear is the way that they're going to go. And it's a, it's a matter and it's an issue that each country and each region have to decide for themselves. Another question? Uh, my name is Mei Ling Chen. Uh, I'm consultant for Friends of the Earth and also as a part-time lecturer in the CTU. Uh, I have a question in relation to the, um, maybe the technical side of the safety system in uh, Dia Bay. Uh, recently in uh, SEM Post is a quoted um, a comment from a leading physicist, uh, Professor He Zhu Xiu in China, that called the Chinese uh, nuclear program unsafe and rash. I'm just looking at um, the technical side, the technical uh, support organization being set up in the mainland in 1989. How, how that institution uh, uh, is credible and how much we can believe in the people that operate the technical side is that, uh, that we could believe in and, and, and think that they take care of us for the public health and uh, environment. You know, I think that's made, I don't know whether you feel that's a slightly unfair question. You know, in, in the sense that we did have uh, Professor Lin from the mainland coming, but because his father got suddenly ill, he had to go back to his hometown. So, you know, we only heard this very late last night. So we, we you know, I mean, obviously we completely understand. Um, now, I think I would ask uh, Mei Ling to hold that question, because actually there's also a purpose to how we design the flow of the conference today. Um, first of all is, we want to flush out all your questions, because I think your questions represent all the questions that Hong Kong people are concerned about. And I think, uh, uh, Michael, you've already uh, pointed us in one direction, which is that we need to build and have trust in the whole system of operation and management. So as we, as a community, go forward, uh, together with China, because we are a part of China, that is obviously the kind of system we need to build and put in place. Um, in terms of, I think, giving a, a, an assessment of where we are, uh, I, I would just hold that thought for the time being. So we, will, uh, we, we do have two other sessions today where we're gonna get close to this, this, this issue. But as I said, it's extremely unfortunate uh, that Professor Lin can't be with us today. So we'll come back to that issue later. Now, uh, we have five minutes left. What I want to do is I want to ask, uh, invite everybody who's got your hand up to just put your question and your concern so that the whole room can hear what they are. And hopefully, all of these issues would be addressed, um, not necessarily all by you, Michael, but by, um, by the others uh, as well. So, uh, uh, ladies who are doing the, the mic, can you just watch who it is and just pass it along to each one of them? Yes. Thank you. So, um, Edwin Lau from Friends of the Earth. 
uh, two questions for me. Uh, actually, I mean the Fukushima uh, Daiichi plant. I, I think uh, what Michael you have explained is is a quite a well designed as compared to the Chernobyl the one. Uh, but still, after three months of the uh, nuclear accident, uh, the leakage of the radio uh, active substance is still leaking out. So, in your opinion, how long? Does it need for the scientists or the engineer to contain, to in, in, in a simple way, to control it, to not to let it continue to leak out to the environment? This is the first question. And the other question is, uh, I want to know, in the world today, is there any really proven technology to contain the radioactive waste that I read from literature that the radioactive waste, uh, when it requires to uh, to lower to safe level from the highly radioactive level, it may take 250,000 years. So any technology proven ones can contain such a waste for such long, long time in our, in our environment. Thank you. Other questions, please? Uh, can I speak in Cantonese? Of course. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm okay, I'll try to speak in English. Um, talking about the consequences of Chernobyl, there's a book published two years ago, um, Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment. Now, actually, in this book, it's pu uh, published by um, New York Acad Academy of Sciences. The statistic shows that uh, there are one million people, one million people died because of the uh, accident. So, um, and half of the globe is contaminated. Before I read this book, I didn't believe it. But uh, okay, if you have time, you really have to look at this book. I mean, when we talk about the risk of using nuclear power, we have to um, have a true picture of the consequences of a um, nuclear disaster. But actually, we don't have the information. One of the reasons is that uh, the WHO and IAAE, actually, they try not to inform the people about the uh, true consequence of it. Because the uh, one of the a mission of IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agents, is to promote the use of nuclear power. How can you expect a, an organization whose mission is to promote nuclear power to tell people that it's really dangerous? And, um, and actually, um, there's some uh, research, a scientific study showing that even in China, um, some soil has been contaminated by cesium-137 because of Chernobyl. Actually, we've been affected, but um, uh, it, and some people, um, people die because of cancers or other diseases, but we can't see the effect immediately because it takes time for cancers to develop. But now I think we have uh, enough time. It's about 20, 25 years after Chernobyl. Now people find out that it's really dangerous. Uh, this technology, and in Hong Kong, um, the Dai Bay nuclear power plant. Within 75 kilometers of it, there, there are um, 280 mi million people living around that within this area. I mean, it's, we have a very um, dangerous thing um, near to us. Now, the, the uh, real question is, who are these people who can decide that they can put this nuclear power plant near to such a huge population. Who are these people? Why they have the authority? Why have they the power to decide our fate? I, I, think I mean, I, all concerns to yes. say no to them, or okay, if you want to put a nuclear power plant near our house, then you have to ask for our consent. But uh, CLP, the, the sponsor, or the organizer, I don't know, um, of this so-called forum, I mean, uh, actually, because they have money, and actually, Excuse they're me. deciding may I, our may face, I, so I, I think we get your picture. We get your picture. And if I were to summarize the totality of the three questions just now, this is exactly the sort of issue Hong Kong will need to discuss. So there are some issues that are related to China's policy of China's expansion. Uh, secondly is there are issues about nuclear technology, clean up, if there was a severe accident, you know, what the time scale and so on. And then there are issues about uh, China's own discussion right now in terms of how fast 
they should expand their program. Now, these are exactly the kind of issues we will need to discuss, but I think for the purpose of this morning, uh, we won't be able to answer all your questions. And indeed, we're not aiming to answer all your questions. Uh, we're trying to provide a level of information and perspective so that within the community, you can all have uh, a, a, a higher level of discussion about this. But there were a few more questions, and I just like, uh, hands out, I just like to take them all. Yes, there's a last gentleman out, oh, two, one, two. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Darren Cattrall, um, just an interested bystander. And I wanted to go back to one point in your slide, Michael, where you said passive designs are a red herring. And I'm just wondering, with the latest designs of nuclear power stations, could they have coped with a magnitude 9 um, earthquake and a 10 meter tsunami? Yeah, my name is Harley Bostock from Geonamics uh, Energy. My question is related to uh, the fuel source. Um, all the nuclear discussions so far have been on using uranium as a fuel source. My question is, uh, already in the United States there has been a thorium uh, nuclear reactor starting from the 1960s, I think. Uh, already China and India have thorium reactor programs underway. And I'm just wondering your opinion on thorium as a fuel source, uh, both advantages and disadvantages uh, going forward, and whether you think <coughs> there is momentum building uh, for the use of thorium reactors post Fukushima. Well, I certainly don't wish to preempt your answer, but again, you know, on fusion, on thorium, these other technologies, we also hope to have a special session on these issues uh, on another occasion. But of course, Michael, you might very well have your views on this and perhaps you can just address that. Sure. Uh, the, the principal advantage of a thorium-fired reactor is, is the non-proliferation issues. Uh, thorium reactors, a, a, a natural up part of the process of light water and your uranium fueled reactors is they create plutonium. And plutonium, of course, is, is a proliferation issue. Thorium reactors don't do that because they don't have any uranium in them. Um, but in terms of the, the everything else that we talked about, they still create fission products, the fission products have to be dealt with, they have decay heat, decay heat has to be dealt with. So the principal difference between thorium and uranium fired reactors is the non-proliferation issues. So to answer your question indirectly or directly, to the extent that you're worried about proliferation, thorium is a better fuel cycle. To the extent that you don't believe or believe that proliferation is a potential issue, then thorium may not be uh, the, the end all. Um, the, the question the gentleman asked earlier with regard to our, our newer designs, uh, with regard to, to natural catastrophes and, and other events, there, there is no doubt. And I, I don't, the, 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 the takeaway that I hope that you take away from here is, is that, that nuclear power operation is much, much more about the people and the institutions that operate it than the technology. That, that in my view, is the takeaway that I want you to walk out of here with. Certainly, though, you know, I'm not an anti-technology, not an anti-advancement uh, person because the, the more that we learn and the more that we know and the better designs that we can do give us greater margins of safety. It allows us to put more defensemen, if you will, in between the guy taking the shot on goal and the goal. So I absolutely advocate that. I believe it. I think it's the right thing to do. And I absolutely hope that newer generations of, of reactors are, are better and better. And there's no doubt in my mind that newer reactors with passive designs and more margin of safety would have helped in this situation. Could they have prevented a core meltdown? Again, I can devise, you give me any reactor design and I can devise a scenario under which the core melts and radioactivity gets to the environment. It's just the fundamental nature of the world we live in. Now, what I propose is, I know this question about the, uh, the book on Chernobyl and I know Malcolm uh, Gribson is going to be prepared to answer that. But since we're moving into the next session where Malcolm is going to speak, I would invite him to do it at the next session. Uh, uh, so perhaps I can hand things back to uh, Andrew Lawson, who can invite the next panel up. But please join me in thanking Michael for his contribution. <laughs>